الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد Oh praise is due to Allah and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to exalt the mansion and grant peace to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to his companions and each and every one who follows them on their righteous path until the day of judgment. Our brothers and sisters in Islam, since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed that establishing worship to him can only be manifest or can only manifest through trials and tests. Establishing worship to Allah can only manifest through trials and tests. It was inev inevitable that in these trials and tests there will be elements of facilitation and elements of deprivation. Elements of facilitation and elements of deprivation. In better words, or this is also known as halal and haram. Elements of facilitation, halal. Do it if it makes life easy for you. Elements of deprivation, being deprived. Don't do it because it is bad for you. And this is something, alhamdulillah, that has been clearly defined in Islam. We have no ambiguity concerning this teaching, particularly when we refer to the famous hadith of Al-Nu'man ibn Bashir, radiallahu anhu wa arda, the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, wherein the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, inna al-halala bayin, wa inna al-harama bayin, wa baynahuma umurun mushtabihatun la ya'lamuhunna kathirun min al-nas. فمن اتقى الشبهات فقد استبرأ لدينه وعرضه ومن وقع في الشبهات وقع في الحرام كالراعي يرعى حول الحمى يوشك أن يرتع فيه ألا وإن لكل ملك حمى ألا وإن حمى الله محارمه ألا وإن حمى الله محارمه ألا وأن في الجسد مضغة إذا صلحت صلح الجسد كله وإذا فسدت فسد الجسد كله ألا وهي القلب. Now was a lot of Arabic, but we will bring the English right now, inshallah تعالى. And I request everyone's kind silence while I speak, if you don't mind. سبحان الله خير. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, "Halal is bayin, clear. It is clear. There's no ambiguity concerning it." And haram is also clear. There's no ambiguity concerning it. And then he went on to say, and between them are doubtful matters, unclear things, concerning which many people have no knowledge of. Many people do not know. Then he said, so whoever avoids these doubtful matters, he shall be protecting and preserving his deen and his ilm, his religious commitment and his honor or dignity. However, whoever falls into these doubtful matters will indeed fall into haram, into the prohibitions. Then he وسلم, struck one of the best examples in the world after the examples that Allah struck in the Quran, wherein he said, it is just like a shepherd who's trying to pasture his flock, his sheep, around a sanctuary, something that doesn't belong to him, someone else's farm. And he's got a sheep with him, and he's trying to pasture them in an area which, you know, he really shouldn't be in. Furthermore, he said, He's just about, it is inevitable that one of these sheep will eventually consume unlawful grass or whatever food they will be eating. Then he said, alayhi salatu salam, verily, every king has a sanctuary. And Allah's sanctuary is his prohibitions. Allah's sanctuary is his prohibitions. Then he said, verily, in the heart, in the body, excuse me, there's a piece of flesh. If it is sound, then the whole body will be sound. If it is corrupt, then the whole body will be corrupt. And it is the? It is the? Heart. Wonderful. Now, <coughs> what do we learn from this hadith? A lot. What can we deal with tonight? 
Not a lot, due to the time. If you to refer back to the books of the scholars, and you see the tafsir and the interpretations and the commentary which they have concerning this hadith, you will find that books can be compiled, just deducing benefits and wisdoms from this one hadith. But we will be touching upon the basic aspects of the hadith, so we will leave this whole this evening, inshallah ta'ala, with some understanding of the halal, the haram, and most importantly, as you saw in the flyer, if you saw the flyer or from the title of the lecture, what is between halal and haram? How do we deal with it? That which is doubtful, how do we deal with it? First, al halalu bayin. Halal is clear. Alhamdulillah. Predominantly. Almost everything we have created is halal. <coughs> Almost everything in the creation of Allah is halal. With the exception of some things. Even though you may get people who try to, you know, turn it around. And we dealt with this in the misconceptions about Islam. That everything is haram. Everything is haram. No. Everything is halal. Haram is some minor issues, minor things that are in, 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 in reality harmful to you as well. <laughs> So you avoiding them is, main, is means of gaining Allah's pleasure and protecting your physical being or spiritual being or mental being or whatever. It is ultimately good for us. So the halal, alhamdulillah, plenty of that. And it is clear. There, there are no questions concerning that. You want to eat beef? Go ahead. You like chicken? Go ahead. Now, of course, we're not dealing with the way of slaughtering, right? And whether it is bake or taza, so this is none of my business. I'm speaking about you know general chicken and general uh, beef. It's halal. On the other hand, al haram bayin. Can anyone say that wine is is okay? Is there any doubt concerning the impermissibility of wine, fornication? You know, and we can list a number of things. No, you will never find someone who agrees unless they really don't have uh, you know they have no understanding of Islam. They're just learning Islam. But anyone with the basic understanding, I don't think anyone in this hall, in fact, Allah knows best, but you know, who doesn't know the major halal things and the major haram things? This is known. Where is our problem in between? And you may be thinking, like what? Right? What are the things that are doubtful? How do I know things that are doubtful? Well, <coughs> if we were to lay down the foundations and see how come we have doubtful things, then it will be easy to identify some examples. I will tell you, the first reason why we may have an un undoubtful matter is the uncertainty of the authenticity of the evidence. Let me repeat. The uncertainty, we're not sure, of the authenticity, is it sound, is it authentic, of the evidence. Is this evidence sound? Usually this is in the area of what? Hadith. Because there's no such thing in the Quran. Everything is authentic. Example. You get a newborn baby, right? You know, cute little thing. You've been waiting for him for nine months or maybe more, you know. And finally, after this long wait, here he comes. And everybody's excited. We want to do the sunnah. We want to implement the sunnah. What, what, brother? What is the sunnah? What is the sunnah concerning newborn babies? You know, at the last minute, you get the phone calls. You know, what do I do? <coughs> do I call the adhan in the right ear and the iqama in the left ear? Did you hear that one before? Who did it? MashaAllah. No one did it besides the brother? Who's had children here? Okay, be honest. Malish. I will ruin your party soon. But until then, you know, let's see you some hands. So only a few brothers had actually called the Adhan. Maybe others didn't do it because they didn't know about it. Not because they knew the reality of the situation. But here's what happened. It's a very popular practice. And it was popular for the longest time. There's a story behind it. Ibn Qayyim al-Jawziyya, rahimahullah, he has a book called Tihfat al-Mawlud, Tihfat al-Wadud fi Ahkam al-Mawlud, right? A, a book dealing with the newborn baby and all the rulings associated with that. Now, first, before we go to this book, there's a hadith in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, narrated by Abu Rafi'. So the hadith is Abu Rafi', right? And the hadith indicates that it's a sunnah to call the adhan in the right ear of the newborn baby and then call the iqama in the left. Well, the one of the, the iqama is a separate story. Let's stick to the adhan in the right ear. Now, <coughs> that same narration in Sunan al-Tirmidhi is da'if. 
it is known to be da'if. However, al muqayyim had mentioned in his book that there was another reference for this hadith in the book of Shu'ab al-Iman lil-Bayhaqi. Where in that he said, Ibn Qayyim said that this narration is also da'if. There's another weak narration in Sunan al-Bayhaqi. So pay attention because this has to do with the science of hadith. We have one weak narration in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, one weak narration in Shu'ab al-Iman lil-Bayhaqi. Now the scholars have differed concerning the approach, but Shaykh al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, who was a scholar of hadith, an expert in this field, he was well versed in the science of hadith, was of the opinion that when we have a number of weak narrations with various chains of narrations, this reality strengthens this hadith. Meaning, the chances for many individuals to narrate the same story through various chains is very unlikely, unless this, this hadith had some basis, right? We may have some issues in the chain of narrators, but that does not, you know, exclude this hadith from being sound or acceptable. So based on his methodology, so okay, we have a hadith which is da'if in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, another one which is da'if in al-Bayhaqi, Shu'ab al-Iman al-Bayhaqi. So this hadith can be acted upon due to this strengthening of the narration because of the references, and then it was allowed for the Muslims to do that. What happened, <coughs> the book, uh, the book, Shu'ab al-Iman, was not available during that time as a book in the various bookstores. After the passage of time, finally the book was actually now with the progress of the, you know, the internet and so the e-books and so on and so forth, finally the book was, became, actually became available. The book became available. And Shaykh al-Albani, rahimahullah, finally had access to the book Shu'ab al-Iman. When he went to that narration, which was referred to by Ibn Qayyim in his book, he found that in the chain of narrators, there were two individuals who were accused of being liars. Individuals who were accused by the scholars of Jarh and Ta'deel, you know, that this person, you don't take narrations from him. If you find this ex-individual in the chain of narrators, this hadith is da'if because of this individual. This is a little complicated, but it may be beneficial at some point in your life, inshallah. The point being, the hadith is da'if, jiddan, very weak. And the methodology of the shaykh was, you do not strengthen a weak narration with a very weak narration. So when he finally realized that Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, had given the wrong ruling by calling it da'if, whereas it should have been da'if jiddan, he realized that this Hadith now cannot hold any water. Consequently, this hadith is inauthentic. Consequently, you cannot act upon it anymore. No more calling the adhan in the, in the right ear. Now, if you did it, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Deeds are according to intentions. If you intended to follow the sunnah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not deprive you of the reward. However, now that you know, <coughs> And if you don't have any knowledge of hadith, you cannot oppose the shaykh unless you have knowledge of hadith, so you may oppose this methodology, then we can no longer act upon this issue. So this, this hadith, this ruling, or this aspect of Islam becomes doubtful. Because we are not sure of the authenticity, we have uncertainty concerning the authenticity of the evidence which we are using. So it was doubtful, now it is clear, for those who follow that methodology. The second example is the applicability of the evidence for a given case. Does this, does this hadith apply? Example, <coughs> this is my favorite. Many of you have heard this too many times, but I have to do it in a lecture. Uh, I've done that in a lecture before. Smoking, smoking, Cigarettes or shisha or I will not mention the other things, right? Any kind of smoking, tobacco and its brothers and sisters and evil uh, used to be among the doubtful matters because they were not sure whether the evidences we had were in fact applicable to this, uh, to this smoking thing, right? Does it apply? We had narrations of do not kill yourselves, right? We had the narrations, وَيُحِلُّ لَهُمْ طَيِّبَاتِ وَيُحَرِّمُ 
ويحرم عليهم الخبائث. When Allah described the Messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم, He said, He makes lawful for them all that which is good. And He makes يحرم, what does يحرم mean? From what word? Haram. He prohibits upon them everything which is evil. So, at some point in time, before the studies were made on nicotine and the cigarette and the chemicals that it contains, it was actually a doubtful matter. Do the narrations or, and the verses dealing with killing yourself and this is being khabitha, are they applicable to smoking or not? So even though it was doubtful at some point in time, back when it first came out in the Turkish, you know, among the Turks, and then it started spreading among the Muslim ummah, <coughs> this is no longer the case today. Smoking has been taken out from the level or the, from the column of doubtful things into the column of what? Haram. And anyone who doubts that needs to reconsider his position. It is haram beyond any shadow of doubt. How can you say that smoking is not haram? How? If we were to look at it from a number of aspects, because we need to remove this doubt. It's a doubtful matter and we need to remove it and take it from between halal and haram into haram. So no one who smokes here <coughs> or no one who knows anyone who smokes will ever entertain this act of smoking, whether for yourself or for your loved ones, maybe a, a sister, her husband uh, uh, smokes or her parents smoke or whatever. Right? Smoking needs to be out of our lives as Muslims who believe in Allah and the last day because of the following. Reason number one, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly stated, and this is the strongest evidence that indicates prohibition, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was to make things which are good halal and things which are evil haram. And no sound human being if he were given the option to categorize cigarette under one of two columns, halal, you know, good or evil, no sound human being, even a child, will put the cigarette under the, the column of good things. Because it, it doesn't make sense whether <coughs> you make the studies or you don't. We have the, the, the element of, of the, the smell. You know, imagine someone smelling like an ashtray. Have you smelled an ashtray before? It stinks, right? Someone next to you smelling like an ashtray. His breath smells like an ashtray. This is, this is repulsive and unacceptable. Let alone entering the masjid and bothering and harming the Muslims, which in return will harm the angels. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ الْمَلَائِكَةَ تَتَأَذَّى مِمَّا يَتَأَذَّى مِنْهُ بَنُوْ آدَمْ Verily, the angels are harmed with that which harms the children of Adam. So, bad smell, whether it is armpit, excuse me, excuse me, armpit, or socks, or feet, or shoes, or sweat, anything which, which generates an, a foul odor is unallowed for a Muslim, particularly in the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So harming the believers is not a joke. Allah says in the Quran, وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بِغَيْرِ مَا اكْتَسَبُوا فَقَدْ احْتَمَلُوا بُهْتَانًا وَإِثْمًا مُبِينًا Very those, those who harm and annoy the believing men and women undeservedly, they don't deserve it. They have, they will bear the crime of slander and clear sin. You have the right to breathe fresh air. Allah created the fresh air for us to breathe. For someone to contaminate this air with this pollution, this is a form of air pollution, and make it in such a way where you are forced to smoke with a smoker through secondhand smoking is a calamity. The smoker is in fact making everyone around him smoke along with him without them wishing to do so. You don't want to smoke. So how would you understand this then if they were to go into a restaurant where there's meat and various kinds of foods and this person you know is just smoking as if he's living alone on this earth and the smoke travels in air 
it winds up going into the food, going into the bread, going into everything. And when you go buy a hamburger, you bought a smoking hamburger. It has been smoked up with smoke, with the various people who have been smoking, let alone the manager of the place who's there all the time smoking, or the employees. This is big haram. Is this doubtful to anyone? SubhanAllah. Killing yourself. Is it allowed for any Muslim to kill himself? Do we commit suicide? Do we get sick of life, say, khalas, I can't deal with it anymore? I'm out? You know, put the rope, hang the rope in, you know, in the house and hang yourself? No. Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does this, he will continue to kill himself on the day of judgment in Jahannam forever. That's the, that's the threat. Somebody shoots himself, he'll be shooting himself over and over and over again. Someone throws himself on the top of a mountain from a building, similarly. So you have Muslims now who come all the way from some you know, far country and they want to die where? In Mecca or Medina. So he you know, rents the highest uh, room up in the hotel and woo, you know, Superman out the window. And Superman is dead on the floor. And well, I've died in Medina. لا يا أخي. No one will do here. No one will do this here. But you've heard, you, I've read this in the newspaper. In the newspapers. People wanting to die in this sacred land. So they come and commit suicide here. We say this defeats the purpose. So killing oneself is not allowed. Okay. This is a glass of water. Now, if I want to put a, a, a glass, I mean a whole glass of poison and drink it, is this halal? Does anyone have any doubt? But it never is haram. But let's do it the other way. If I say, check it out guys, I'm not gonna kill myself just instantaneously. How about <coughs> I do this? According to doctors, if I consume whatever, two milliliters of, of poison, I will die. So I will put a glass of water and I will put, uh, let's say three milliliters. I put one milliliter today. And this coming lecture, inshallah, this coming Monday, FYI, titled Errors in Connection, uh, will be, I will take another one milliliter. And on the third one, I will take the third and then I will die on the last, you know, lecture, which will fall on a Monday, after having consumed the three milliliters of poison. Does that make it halal? It is still what? Suicide. So we have quick, you know, suicide and long-term suicide. Now, have you ever purchased a product in your life that said on it, you know, uh, be careful, I have poison, you would probably get cancer and die, you know, and you buy it afterwards? Huh? Imagine, you know, you go with your children to the supermarket and there's a chocolate bar that says, you know, contains chemicals, you know, and whatever, gasoline. If you drink, you know, if you eat too many of these, your children will die. Would you buy it for your son? No way. I mean, because advertising necessitates that they lie. The only company in the world that doesn't lie when it comes to the product is are this, you know, the cigarette companies. They tell you clearly. And a, a Muslim will go afterwards and buy this? Pay fulus. Fulus, which we've been working hours for. Hard working hours, you know, day and night. You know, we have family back home who need the money. Who if you give them this four or five riyals, they may eat with it for a week. We find some Muslims, may Allah rectify our condition in theirs, use it to buy cigarettes. So now they're wasting money in something which is haram. What is the point? Smoking is haram. Anyone who says it is doubtful has no knowledge of this matter. And you don't listen to him. I gave you the evidences. They are convincing as you can see. Consequently, my brothers and sisters in Islam, we cannot smoke and we cannot let anyone around us smoke as well. We must Enjoy what is good and forbid what is evil. There's no compromising in this element of our deen. We have not been favored as a nation <coughs> except because of this quality. Now if you brothers and sisters who come to da'wah, who have da'wah tendencies, da'wah inclinations, the, 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 the tendency to become you know, rightly guided, to be good Muslims, if we don't do this, who's going to do it? The, the people who don't show up? No one will do it anymore. And we may be destroyed as an ummah. So when you see someone smoking, get involved. Memorize the evidences. They're available in many fatawa. Know the rulings. And stop the people from smoking. 
explain it in a nice way, be gentle, be kind, use your personal approach in da'wah. However, we cannot afford to leave people around us smoking. It is shocking to see two brothers sitting next to each other, one who seems to be practicing, another one who's, you know, whatever, and the other one is smoking next to him and the brothers are sitting there conversating with him. I mean, in reality, you shouldn't allow this. Say, Ali, subhanAllah, no respect for me. You have no respect for me. I'm sitting here having a conversation with you. You smoking in my face? Puffing smoke in my face? No. Put out the cigarette. I mean, this is your right. So if we don't do this, the smokers will think that no one will ever stop them. So they will continue to smoke everywhere all the time. And when you try to stop them, they will look at you funny. And this happens nowadays. You know, I've, you know we've had people say, mind your business, man. Why are you, everybody smokes. Why do they bring it into the country? Look at this funny. Huh? Why is, if, if it was haram, why is it in the country? MashaAllah. This justifies it now? If people are committing zina in this country, so we say zina is halal. Say, Wallah, people are committing zina. Say, what the people do has nothing to do with the ruling in the book of Allah and the sunnah of his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So then, concerning this particular point, smoking used to be doubtful, now it is not. It is haram. Please remember that. Act upon it and share it with others. <coughs> طيب. Let us look briefly at the reasons why we have this doubtful matters or why do people wind up falling into doubtful matters. First of which is lack of knowledge. Due to lack of knowledge, we have in fact uh, fell into many doubtful matters. Some of them which constitute being innovations. This will be dealt with in the second point. But the first point, I want to give you an example so we will have some clarity. You are in the masjid on the day of Jumu'ah, okay? And half an hour or so before the Imam comes, there is what we call the first Adhan. We're on the same page? Five. The Mu'adhan calls the Adhan and you're sitting there, you know, repeating after him, getting the Sunnah in and whatever, <coughs> in terms of the Dua. When he is done, what do you do? He finishes. You got 40 minutes, something like that, until the Imam comes and the second Adhan is called. The first Adhan is done. What do you do in the meantime? Read Quran. Anything else? I'm sorry? Read Dua. Anything else? Nawafil? How many? Four. I'm not, I'm not going to look at the speaker as that, so it will be... <laughs> <laughs> be more neutral. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked that that was not the first suggestion. Pray the four rak'at, sunnah, right? Is this a sunnah? It is not a sunnah. Why is it not a sunnah? Because at the time of the Prophet wasallam, they had only one of them. So he would come in, immediately go to the mimbar, Get on the member, say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will then sit down, the muaddin will call the adhan, and then immediately afterwards the khutbah will begin. <coughs> there was no second adhan. When did that come in? In the khilaf of Uthman radiallahu anhu. Uthman is which khalifa among, among the khulafa? Third. So that means we had, that means we had Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, then Umar, then Uthman. It wasn't until Uthman when the Muslims became huge, mashallah, in size, in numbers. And then it was necessary that they would first notify the people about the first one. And then, so they would come to the masjid, then the second one was the actual first azan, azan at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Now you may say, hold on, is this an innovation? Is Uthman innovating into the deen radiallahu anhu wa arda? No. Why? What's the evidence? What's the evidence? عليكم بسنتي وسنة الخلفاء الراشدين المهديين. Prophet Sallam clearly told us, upon you is my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided خلفاء. Uthman رضي الله عنه was from the rightly guided خلفاء. His sunnah, then whatever he saw fit during that time, is actually from the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. Unless it opposed something that he عليه الصلاة والسلام did. 
Then yes, the Sahaba may be on a position other than that of the Prophet because the, the information was not conveyed to them or for whatever other reason. So then, the reality is, my brothers and sisters in Islam, and this is strictly for the brothers, there's no sunnah before or after the first adhan on the day of Jum'ah. What the Sahaba used to do, they would go early to the masjid, unlike us today. Today, if you go to any masjid, with no exception, no exception, usually, uh, around the time the Imam is there, there are only a few rows. The vast majority of people enter with him <coughs> or after him. What well, really after him? Then suddenly the masjid becomes full. Why? We have become lazy. Lazy on a Friday. Like the disbelievers. Friday, you know, they wait for Friday, because Friday is there, you know, the, the night where they party, right? So uh, Friday, you know, is the day of entertainment. We have Friday as a day, not for holiday. Many people think it's holiday. Allah said in the end of Surah Al Jum'ah, after you're done with the salah, fantashiru, then we'll go around earth and, and seek provision from Allah and remember Allah abundantly. There's no harm in doing business on a Friday. But we have become what? Lazy. So one of us will go to bed, you know, Thursday night at, you know, 3 in the morning. Then he would, if he wakes up for Fajr, alhamdulillah. If he does wake up for Fajr, he will go back to sleep after Fajr to wake up at what? 12.15. Running around trying to shower, pull on the clothes, and you know, this is the situation. But this is not befitting. And this is a whole other lecture, inshallah, at, at its right time. So then, the sunnah here is that there is no sunnah. The Sahaba will come early and they will pray, Nawafil Mutlaqa. What does that mean? General voluntary prayers. He will come pray two, four, six, eight, ten, as long as he wants. For two hours he's praying. Nafila. He's not praying with the, with the intention of praying the sunnah before Dhuhr as on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. This is not the intention, right? So, <coughs> when we actually do that, we have fallen into a doubtful matter because some of the ulama are of that opinion. But it's because of the fact that we are lacking knowledge of this reality. There's no evidence that the Prophet ﷺ ever prayed anything at home before Jumu'ah nor did the Sahaba do that. So then this is one example of why we fall into, undoubt, into doubtful matters because of what? Lack of knowledge. Lack of fiqh. Lack of fiqh, what does that mean? Fiqh means understanding or the practical implementation of the Quran and the Sunnah in our daily lives. This is what fiqh means. You, know I mean? you hear the translation jurisprudence and you may say this is more complicated than the word fiqh. I was having a hard time understanding fiqh in Arabic, now this English word is even worse. And it, mean, it means the implications and the implementation of the Qur'an and the Sunnah in our daily lives. Understanding the intent behind the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Because of this element, my brothers and sisters in Islam, in fact, almost all of the innovations, with the exception of some, are due to this misunderstanding. People don't understand the objective of the deed. For example, <laughs> celebrating the various birthdays, or festivals, or things of this nature. You get people with the rational, you know, uh, birthday. Say, brother, you said that celebrating birthday is an innovation. Say, yes. He says, but it's not an act of worship. It is not an act of worship. Akhi, but you're imitating the disbelievers. Yeah, but this is not part of their deen also, right? It's not part of their religion. It's not like a Christian says this is part of the, you know, the teachings of the church, right? They do it for what? Why do people celebrate birthdays? Be honest. Tell me the truth. Why do people celebrate birthdays? Gifts. Barakallah Gifts, man. Come on now. You know, if you used to celebrate birthdays before, if people can showed up to your house with no gifts, you will kick him out. You want to eat my cake? Where's my gift, man? Where's my iPhone? Where's my recorder? Where's my shoes? Ma salama. Out. You will never talk to him again. Your friend will become your enemy the next day. What kind of rude person is this? Coming to my house with no gift. What is it? Gifts. Christmas, gifts. New Year's, gifts. People love gifts. So this is an opportunity. Okay, I buy the cheapest thing for the people and I get the most expensive from them. This is the mind of the man. You know, you get this for three reals and he will give me the gift for 30 riyals, and it's just a bunch of calculations trying to acquire worldly material. That's what it is. 
There's no other objective. Taib, a Muslim, does he have this approach in life? Come on, brothers, give me gift. I don't think so. Can you say it's not an act of worship? It is, they say, they claim, those who celebrate birthdays, it is not an act of worship. We say, time out. Forget about the kuffar, imitating the kuffar, it's not part of the religion. If it's not part of the religion, you can do it. Otherwise, you cannot wear a t-shirt. Because a kafir wears a t-shirt, and we didn't wear t-shirts before, so no more t-shirts, we say no. This is not specific to their religion. It's a matter which there's room in it. <coughs> so then how do you refute that? We say, okay, when you gather the people to your house, and you're saying it's not an act of worship, what is your intent? I mean, what is the purpose behind choosing that day where you were born to have a good time, to enjoy yourself? They will tell you, without a doubt, so I can be thankful to Allah. He gave me another year of life, right? He gave me another year in life to live, to prosper. Say, okay, when you praise Allah, is it an act of worship or not? Praising Allah, alhamdulillah, is it an act of worship or not? Do you have to do it according to the sunnah or not? Can you praise, some people like to praise Allah by dancing. Okay, say, hey man, this is the Sufis. You know, they go around, until they get dizzy, they got nothing to do. Right? They say, you know, this is, you know, we dhikr, Allah, Allah, Allah. How are they, you know, beating themselves? I don't know where these people came from. And, and they claim to be among the masses of the Muslims. We got funny individuals. Go to YouTube. Don't even go to YouTube. But because there's so much evil there. Uh, but if you're able to go and Google these things and go strictly to the video, you will not believe some of the things you see. I mean, people, you know, dancing and doing all kinds of funny stuff in the name of Islam. And they consider this what? Worship to Allah. Just like the Christians in church, in some other countries, without naming them, if you were to go to church on Sunday, you will think it's a disco. They got pianos, guitars, and the whole, you know, there's a whole musical band. And you know, people screaming on the thing and crying, hallelujah and all this. What is this, a party? It's not worshiping, this is this people having a good time listening to music. So this is their concept of what? Praising the Lord. So we have Muslims who follow the footsteps that Prophet told us. The point being, if you're saying that you're just being thankful to Allah, you have to be thankful to Allah in a way which He legislated. So now this very intent of yours is an innovation. And this doubtful matter becomes clear. But why was it doubtful for, for that individual? His understanding of fiqh was not there. He did not know what was the intent behind the Quran and the Sunnah when they brought these teachings of what? The distinction and the individuality of Muslims in comparison to the people around them. We are unique, we are special, we are superior. We say this with confidence. Allah made us as an ummah like that. So we don't follow those who are beneath us. We don't imitate those who Allah does not love or is not pleased with. Otherwise, this is misunderstanding of the deen. You see what I'm saying? So if you have this understanding, you could clarify many misconceptions in terms of our conduct. <coughs> do I do this because the kuffar do it or not? then we have to go to the basic understandings of Islam. What if, if you understood this concept of worshipping Allah is conditional to a textual evidence, then you will know that even the birthday as a means of thanking Allah is no longer lawful. Not because it's imitating the kuffar or otherwise, because they will be able to answer that. With that, you can remove this doubtful matter and it moves on to the uh, category of haram. Because innovations are halal or haram? Haram. <coughs> Thirdly, Lack of contemplation. What is contemplation? <laughs> Pondering, reflecting. Sometimes we haste. We don't think long enough. And when we don't think enough, we come up with funny stuff. Uh, just recently, uh, a beloved brother of mine, who is a revert to Islam, it appears from his name at least, who I, I, I've been corresponding with via email. Uh, he always has different questions in some other country. I don't know what the country is. <coughs> he sent a question that said, Brother, I have a serious problem. Khair. That's what you say. Khair. May Allah make it good. He said, I do not understand how can Allah punish someone in the hellfire for eternity. How is it that Allah will not show mercy to these people at some point in time. I believe, or I've heard that some say, that at some point in time, they will be taken out from Jahannam. Okay? This was the issue. Please advise, comment, you know,
guide me <coughs> in this area. Now, if you think about it, right now when you heard it, huh, what happened to you? You're like, oh, oh yeah, huh? yeah, this is right. Is it possible that Allah will, you know, Allah Rahman Rahim, He will leave someone in Jannah forever? Huh? What does the shaitan start doing? Try to whisper nonsense. So we will be, it, become, it becomes doubtful, even though this is from the aqil of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Huh? Khalidina fiha. They shall, abide, they shall abide therein eternally. Okay, there's no doubt. I'm not going to give you a lecture about the belief of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. The belief of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is people who enter Jahannam among the kuffar shall never go out. Never go out. The Muslims, they will go in, then once they pay their. <coughs> The consequences of their sins, they will be taken to Jannah. The disbelievers, no. But let's contemplate. Have you contemplated on this before? Before we came to this conclusion? I will give you two approaches. One which I have mentioned before, and one which I have not mentioned before. <coughs> the first one, I mentioned before. You hire an employee. And you give him all, you know, you invest in him. The company is going out of business, out of business. Big company. And they have... 50,000 riyals or not even, more than that, left. And the only way they can, they can grow and boom as a business is by hiring an IT who will be able to develop a software for them which will make them superior to the contending and uh, uh, competing businesses around them. So they find this unique individual who's qualified and has everything that he needs. They get in touch with him, you know, they contact him, say, listen, we want to hire you. We will give you everything. We will spend the last halala we have in you. So you may develop the software. Please, this business is multi, you know, uh, expensive, you know, multi-million businesses going out of business. We need your help. We will give you a castle. You will have six cars. As soon as you land, we'll get you married to the most beautiful woman in our city. Marriage, hypothetically speaking. But it doesn't happen in real life. Uh, you name it, you want clothes, we will give you. You want you know, leadership, we will give you. Everything you want shall be given to you. Please, just develop this what? The software. For the purpose of what? <coughs> Enhancing and saving this business from destruction. And indeed, they, this, this uh, deal materializes. They get the man, he comes over or from overseas to the kingdom or whatever, and they give him all the tools and the machines and the, the PC, everything is high, state of the art, high tech. Just put together this software. And he starts working. <coughs> In the process of his work, he meets an employee who works at one of the contending businesses, one of their competitions. And he starts feeling very bad for this helpless employee who is also suffering with this company, right? <coughs> So he decides that he will develop this software and then give it as a gift to the other employee. He does. He develops it. He says, this is a gift for you, for you and your business to grow and boom. Thank you very much. The next day, the other business is making, you know, millions of riyals and our friend's, you know, company is asking about their software. Hey, this was today was the deadline. Where's the software? Oh, the software, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I finished it, but I gave it to my friend who works for this business across the street. Huh. What would they do to him? Celebration? Let's have a party. Oh, great news, man. Thanks. What would they do to him? Now, of course, if the manager had a shotgun, you know, it would be right over, right then and there, right? Somebody would shoot him. Uh, <coughs> but worst case scenario, if they didn't shoot him because they don't want to go to jail, this person will be persecuted in the worst ways possible. They will try to damage him, damage his family, destroy his career, destroy his life. And if they were able to keep him in prison until he dies, they will not give him any mercy. They will say, he deserves it. Why? You've utilized our bounties and you had given them, huh? you served someone else. If this is the case with a human being, company, and some fulus, then what about the condition of the son of Adam with his Lord? Allah created it, gave him life, sustenance. In fact, every breath that this person breathed 
was by the will of Allah. He has no control of it. He made sure his mother loved him enough to nurse him and be patient with him. Otherwise, all infants will be thrown out the window from the first day. If, if women had no patience, if women had no patience after a few hours of crying, maybe somebody will open the window and throw away the baby. I don't need to deal with this anymore. Life was good before this baby came. But what do they have? Patience. He cries and he cries and he defecates and urinates and cries and burps and pukes. All nasty stuff, right? The children are the nastiest things in the world, even though they're cute. But women have no problem with that. That's her baby. She loves him. Why? Allah instilled that in the mother. If the mother didn't have this quality, we men stay aside, then it will be a problem for the children. <coughs> Who made this the way it is? Allah. <coughs> then he gave them a mind. He gave them understanding. He gave them clothing and food, sustenance. Then he gave them a messenger whom he sent with a message, with a detailed, huh? detailed explanation of the purpose of life. Where are you going? How do you get there? What you need to do? What you need to avoid? A mind, an intellect, a natural disposition. Everything was given from who? From Allah. Then the son of Adam wants to consume all of that and go worship Jesus and the saints and, uh, and the, the sun and the moon and himself and other people and the cows and so on and so forth. What is this? What will you do to these people? They deserve the punishment. Think about it. They are taking everything and, and there's no excuse. Brothers and sisters, there's not even a single human being, unless those who were born crazy, insane. But these are not held accountable in Islam. Any sane individual, there's no way that in their natural understanding, in their natural disposition, they know that they should worship Allah. They know that in the depth. But they leave it aside. They, they ignore it deliberately. Don't have any misconceptions about that. So when they continue to ignore Allah all their lives, what do they expect from Allah in their life to come? Punishment. Example number one. Example number two. I come late. I came late today. Three minutes. Forgive me for that. I'm still unhappy about that. But again, I blame the, the masjid which took longer to call the iqama, longer to finish the salah. Alhamdulillah. Imagine somebody was playing a prank on me. Okay? Before I came in here, someone put poison for me with the water. Trying to play games with me for whatever reason. I come in here say, I'm sorry I'm late. Huh? Now everybody here, brother, stop! Huh? There's poison in there. What am I supposed to do? Imagine all of you, all of you, without an exception, those whom I know personally and those who I don't, Muslims who, whom I'm supposed to trust, they tell me, brother, and you have a serious face, you're not playing. Wallahi, there's poison in here. What am I supposed to do? Stop. Imagine if I said, mind your business. You fools, excuse me, and I drank, and I died. What would you feel? He deserves it. And I wish he would come back to life again and die again. What a fool, you are the fool. Why? This is a natural feeling. Akhi, what are you, we, everybody's, everybody's lying to you? you? You ignore everyone, you belittle everyone? This is, no, you cannot deny this, huh? You cannot deny this. Your feeling will be, you, de you know, you deserve it, man. We told you, no heat, no attention. Why? Because someone who ignores with arrogance, he deserves punishment. He deserves what he gets. This is the condition of the kafir. He's told, he's warned, be careful. There's Jahannam. Ah, don't worry about it. Mind your business. I know what I'm doing. I know what I believe. This is the same. This is, the other one is worse than this one. The other one is worse than this one because this is a matter of the dunya the other one is a matter of faith which Allah had instilled in the children of Adam we were born believers right or wrong we were born upon the fitrah so if you were to contemplate it would no longer be very shocking to you that, that these believers will be burning eternally because really they deserve it so then we come across doubtful things because of what lack of contemplation or <coughs> uh, pondering the last is ill intentions. People, a'udhu billah, yani, they, they see the element of feeding Allah in some of our, the lives of some of the Muslims is actually missing. It's missing. So you find that we know that this is doubtful, but because of our ill intentions, our wicked, you know, intents, 
we wind up ignoring the fact that we know it is doubtful and we deliberately uh, you know, engage and, and partake in this particular thing. Knowing that the Prophet ﷺ said that whoever falls into the doubtful things will wind up falling into haram. The, the nature of the son of Adam. Once you start playing with the doubtful things, your soul, your, your nafs will start calling you into that which is impermissible. So we will eventually fall into the impermissible and we will be destroyed. So when you have ill intentions, <coughs> we will know that something is doubtful, but we will not care. And you come across this every day. People that tell you, I know, I know, but when you look into the affairs, we will find that we are not implementing the knowledge which we have. We know that I'm not, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I can't stop doing it. So this was the last, and I will give you no example concerning that. So let us say at the end, the wisdom behind these doubtful matters. You may say, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, uh, make, you know, this, these doubtful things, uh, you know, uh, be, ex exist in our lives? Why did Allah make them exist in our lives? They're making things complicated. No. In fact, this is means of testing. Furthermore, this is how we distinguish the people of knowledge from those who don't know. Because you find that the pe people of knowledge, the scholars, and you know, those who are scholars, <coughs> not anyone here, they will actually go into the depth of these matters. So they may clarify for the Muslims the halal from the haram. Had everything been clear, like as they say, black and white, and there was no gray, then it would be very easy. But testing is actually in the gray area. When you know something is wrong, khalas, when you, when you do it, you're blameworthy, right? When you know something is right and you don't do it, you're blameworthy. But when it's gray, here's where you are being tested with your desires, <coughs> the whispers of the shaitan, and you having wara. What is wara? Cautiousness. Being cautious. Listen, I know this may be okay, but let me leave it alone for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let me leave it alone in order not to fall into that which is doubtful. So with, the, with this, the people of knowledge become appreciated among the Muslims because they are our reference when it comes to areas which we ourselves cannot identify because of the <coughs> variations in the teachings of Islam. Okay. So this is from the wisdom of Allah because the most honorable status is the people of knowledge, is that of the people of knowledge. <laughs> Allah raises in degrees those who believe amongst you and those who were given Knowledge. Allah raises them in degree. So the alim, uh, you know, becomes superior or supersedes the other one through his knowledge of these intricate details of Islam and being knowledgeable of the doubtful matters in Islam. So when he presents them to the people, they are no longer doubtful. So when we come to the area of smoking, for example, you may hear it from a number of individuals and you may not be convinced. When you hear it from a scholar, you know, who breaks it down with the evidences, it's no longer doubtful. So this is important. Now the scholar becomes virtuous in the sight of Allah <coughs> subhanahu wa ta'ala. And last but not least, what we need to understand, <coughs> excuse me, brothers and sisters in Islam, is really the purpose of life. When we know why we were created, we will have the proper approach concerning every single doubtful matter in Islam. If we knew that Allah Azza wa Jal has made this life a fitna. fitna, And we will test you with evil and good as a trial. When we know that, and we strictly avoid the evil and the doubtful, and we enjoy and act upon the good, then we are in fact guaranteeing ourselves a place in paradise in the life to come. Guarantee bi Allah Because Allah will not place someone in Jahannam who has striven in his life to be among the righteous. Allah will not, will not punish someone who is striving in this dunya to enter Jannah. Whereas, <coughs> if we don't have this right understanding, we will get the shaitan playing many games with us. And the biggest game he has is what? Allahu ghafoorun rahim. Allah is all forgiving, most merciful. Ma'alish, I will do this. I know it's wrong. I will do it. I know it's doubtful. I will do it. But Allah is forgiving. Allah is most merciful, but brother and sister, Allah had already said in the Quran that Allah is shadidul iqab, He is also severe in punishment. This is an amazing ayah in the Quran. Allah said to the Prophet Muhammad, inform my slaves, 
that I am the most forgiving and the most merciful. But the ayah continues, and that my punishment is the most severe punishment. Two sides of the coin. Don't only look at one. There's also severity in punishment. So we don't play around. We don't play around with something that will land us in Jahannam. Because at the end of the day, I will finish with these ayat. Allah says in the end of Surah Al-Nazi'at, فَإِذَا جَاءَتِ الطَّامَّةُ الْكُبْرَى يَوْمَ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانُ مَا سَعَى وَبُرِّزَتِ الْجَحِيمُ لِمَيْ يَرَى فَأَمَّا مَنْ طَغَى وَآثَرَ الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا فَإِنَّ الْجَحِيمَ هي المأوى صلى الله عليه وسلم وأما من خاف مقام ربه ونهى النفس عن الهوى فإن الجنة هي المأوى This is the bottom line of everything These few ayat They summarize our lives in this life and our lives to come Allah said So when there comes to them the greatest catastrophe which is the day of judgment It covers everything because of its greatness and magnitude يَوْمَ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانُ مَسَعَ On that day, the son of Adam shall remember what he was striving for in the dunya. Because all the deeds will be presented to us on our book of deeds. Then we are divided into one of two categories. As for the first, وَأَمَّا فَأَمَّا مَنْ طَغَى وَأَثَرَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا As for he who transgresses by falling into the haram and the doubtful and following the desires and the whims and lusts وَآثَرَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا And he favored the life of this world. These are the two destructive qualities. Transgressing against Allah's limitations and favoring the dunya over the akhirah. What will be the abode? The hellfire. On the other hand, the other kinds of people whom I'll ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make me and you among them, as for those who fear standing before their Lord, they fear the day of judgment, that I will come with my book of deeds, and angels shall be presenting me and bringing me forth, dragging you in front of Allah. And Allah Azza wa Jal will ask you and remind you, you did this on that day, you did this on that day, and all everything will be presented to Allah. If we were to fear that day, then we would prepare for it right now. There'd be no playing around, there'd be no following desires, they'd be trying to be the best Muslims we can ever be. Excuse me. The best Muslims we can ever be. We would fall short. We would not be perfect. Each one of us here has his own shortcomings which only Allah knows about. However, that does not mean that we don't strive because that day is coming. So the one who fears is standing before his Lord. And then, وَنَهَا النَّفْسَ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ And he prevents his soul from what it, what it desires, from evil, evil desires. There are lawful desires and unlawful desires. If you stop yourself from following what it likes, which is not pleasing to Allah, فَإِنَّ الْجَنَّةَ هِيَ الْمَأْوَىٰ this is the reality. I mean, it's unbelievable how clear Allah has made the message. How clear the teachings are. This is the simple, I mean, if you were to learn physics or mathematics or anything, it would be way more complicated, right? The triangles and then right angles and forget it, man. Acute and this and that, this is a headache. This is simple stuff. Look, man, you don't transgress, huh? You don't favor the life of the dunya. That's the first thing, the two things you need to leave alone. Two things you need to leave alone. On the other hand, you fear standing before Allah, so you bring to mind the accountability. And you stop yourself from what it desires, you'll go to paradise. Is there any simpler equation than that? This is the simplest in the world. What are we missing? Implementation. What are we missing? Acting upon this basic information. Because of what? Our evil self sometimes, the shaitan, along with that. And, you know, allowing ourselves to mix with people who don't fear Allah. All these are elements of destruction. We need to be in this life as what? Strangers. Try to be, you know, a, a Muslim who takes the deen seriously. When you do so, then you can only expect blessings from Allah. The happiest people on earth are the believers, not the Muslims. The believers among the Muslims who have the highest level of belief. These are the most honorable among the Muslims and the most content in terms of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had revealed. So their hearts are open to Islam. Their hearts, فَمَا يُرِدِ اللَّهُ أَنْ يَهْدِيَهُ يَشْرَحْ صَدْرَهُ لِلْإِسْلَامِ Whoever Allah wants to guide, He will open His chest to Islam. What does that mean? This applies to the kafir and to the believer. 
Meaning you, you love Islam. When you learn something new, you can't wait to put it into practice. Not you learn something you say, oh no. But I like to do that, brother. Are you sure this is haram? Are you, are you sure Allah said I have to do this? Come on now. But I like this. I like, you no, know, this is Allah has not opened you just for Islam. The Sahaba, when any information was given to them, ala tool, they would put it into practice. They wouldn't ask, uh, excuse me, Messenger of Allah, is this a sunnah or a wajib? Never. When he told them something, whether it is voluntary or obligatory, they what? They acted upon it. Why? They loved Islam. They loved Allah. They loved to please Allah. They loved to imitate the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu So they were the most successful people who ever walked upon this earth. And if we wish to follow their footsteps, then we need to have the same attitude. So I invite myself and you to this way of life. To this attitude. That, that of the successful individuals. We cannot depend on ourselves because we are weak. We depend on Allah. We need to beg Allah to grant us that. Beg Allah, oh Allah, make me, use me as service for Islam. Make me someone who serves your religion. Utilize me for the propagation of this deed. This is a dua which we should have, as, even if we're not saying it verbally, in, 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 in fact, in feelings. We should want to be Muslims, good Muslims, serving Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will become pleased with us and make us among the inhabitants of Jannah. وآخر دعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد. Wonderful. The way we understand this, أخي, is in the light of what we know as general. Let me see the brother because I like to look at the question. What we we look at this, أخي, in the light of you know what both are from the teachings of Islam, and our understanding is that there's never any contradiction. So whenever we have things which appear to be contradicting one another, we have to understand one in the light. Of the other. The general ruling is having a bad smell is not allowed. The exception is when you're fasting because it is beyond your ability. So consequently you will not be held accountable for that because it is it is required of you to do so. This is in terms of the negligent individuals. Those who go to bake and eat garlic, you know, with the, the judge, and then he goes to the masjid burping from the beginning of the salah until the end. So this one, uh, this is concerning those individuals. Or those who don't shower, or they don't, you know, they don't remove their armpit hair, <coughs> and so, and they don't use means of, of you know, uh, beautifying their smell and so on and so forth. Then you know, whoever has shortcomings in this area, is that clear, Salam? Uh, how do we, as uh, lay people, judge know what opinion is stronger when there are uh, two trusted scholars that have opposing views on a big issue? <coughs> well, it's, uh, in fact, the scholars have uh, uh, different advice concerning this issue. Some of them say, you follow that which is safer. Okay? That which is more safe. Yani farther from uh, impermissibility. Uh, others say, you follow the, the scholar who you trust more, who you think is more feeling of Allah. Others say, you follow the scholar who is more knowledgeable in that area of the deen. Meaning if you have a <coughs> muhaddith and a faqeer, and the issue is an issue of fiqh, not an issue of hadith, then you go with the opinion of the faqih if both are equal in your sight as far as God feeding, you know, individuals. And the last opinion, which is the one that should be avoided, is that you follow which is, with the one which is easier. <coughs> because this opens the door for falling into very many and doubtful things. So even though it is there amongst my advice to you, advice not a fatwa, my advice is go with that which is safer from the scholar who is more you know, uh, knowledgeable in that science of Islam. If it is hadith, an issue of authenticity of hadith, then go with the alim of hadith. If it is fiqh, fiqh, mufassir, with the mufassirin, <coughs> tafsir with the mufassirin, and so on and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me. Question number six, mashallah, tabarakallah. Question number two. Uh, to what extent should one have taqlid when following a madhab? Are all the madhabs equally correct in their rulings? Can one opinion be stronger than another? <coughs> Excuse me, how can a person judge this? There will be a, a whole lecture dedicated to this matter titled, What is your madhab? So be patient, inshallah, because I don't want to you know, ruin it ahead of time. If, if anyone uh, is, is in a dire need to know, then you can email me at one way to paradise at gmail.com 
Inshallah ta'ala, and then I will I will give you what is available so far concerning this issue. Yes? A good deed washes away. Yes, <coughs> it's in the Quran and in the Sunnah. Allah says in the Quran, Inna al hasanati yudhibna asayyad. Very the good deeds remove the bad deeds. And Prophet said, Itba al hasanati, uh, itba al sayyat al hasana, tamhuha. And follow up an evil deed with a good one, it shall erase it. So you got it right there. <coughs> Okay. Clear, clear. Inshallah. But let me deal with the questions since they're from the floor before we deal with the papers. It's easier for me to read them. This I may forget. Concerning the first one, Yaqi, uh, well, let's put it that way. Um, at the time of the Sahaba, or even at the time of the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, when someone came to the masjid smelling like garlic or onions, they would actually kick them out of the masjid and send them to al baqir to a graveyard. So they may hang out there, right, and not harm the Muslims in the Salah. Now today, this may not be uh, very much <coughs> applicable, because if you were to try to take someone out of the masjid, you'd be taken out of the country. So you leave that alone. Wisdom is necessary for the believer. What you do is you run away from this person after you have what? Advised them. You must advise him. Say, Akhi, you smell like cigarettes. Your presence here is forbidden. You are harming me and the angels. You come in to gain reward with the salah, you are leaving with sin. It is not allowed for you to be here in the masjid. Please, for the sake of Allah, you need to stop smoking. Or in the meantime, until you quit smoking, before coming to the masjid, don't smoke. And brush your teeth. And put on some perfume. I mean, do all the necessary. So you will not come here smelling like cigarettes. If someone needs you in the salah, then your salah is valid. However, if you know that this masjid has a tendency to have a smoke lead you in the salah, don't pray at that masjid anymore. Right? But you advise them as well. I mean advice all the time. <coughs> this is what I could think of concerning the first question. Concerning the second question, uh, it's very tough. If you see someone is 50 or 60 years old, meaning there are some almost senior citizens or are, and try to convince someone at that age uh, that he's wrong and you're right is usually far-fetched. But that does not mean that we don't attempt and try. You need usually to bring someone who is older, closer to them in age, who knows Islam, so he may explain this misunderstanding. And you try to tell them that this statement of theirs is equal to that of the mushrikeen. Inna wajadna aba'ana ala umma wa inna ala atharihim muhtadun. The mushrikeen when they were go to Islam and to the Tawheed, they said, really we find our forefathers following the religion and we will be following their footsteps. See, this is imitating the disbelievers. A Muslim goes with the truth wherever it may take it. And we don't favor the opinion of anyone over the ruling of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anyways, that requires a lecture, akhi. And inshallah, we will deal with that in some of the coming lectures, bi Allah azza wa jal. Uh, question three, <coughs> there are so many various groups in Islam, how do we know which one is correct? Allah al musta'an <coughs> When most claim they are from the Quran and Sunnah, when Prophet Sallallahu drew, uh, drew a line in the ground with branches going out of each, uh, does this hadith mean there is one group that is upon the truth only? Yes, that's what it means. There is one group, however, that one group is not a particular number of individuals who are present in one location in some place down the street who call themselves and so it is them and only them that is not the case <coughs> a group includes the Prophet ﷺ, the Sahaba, the Tabi'een and all those who follow their footsteps until the Day of Judgment all these are part of the group and this group is the group of Ahl Sunnah why? because they follow the Sunnah any further naming is questionable, at least to say, even if some uh, endorse it and some don't, and some, there's a huge debate concerning that, the least to say, it is questionable to have another name concerning Ahlul Sunnah wa Jama'ah, those who follow the way <coughs> of the the Sahaba and the Tabi'in. So this group is not some individuals who have a website, 
huh? have a masjid and khalas. These are the brothers and everybody else is deviant. Not that. They could be scattered around all over the Muslim world and outside the Muslim world. Anyone who follows the Quran and the Sunnah according to the understanding of the three uh, virtuous generations, then he is upon the group who will be saved. Right? So I hope inshallah that deals with that. Is there such a thing as good bid'ah? How can you understand this term according to what it was really meant? Many scholars use the term to in introduce good acts of worship in the deen. Good acts of worship. Wow. Look, look at this statement. <coughs> they use this term to introduce good acts of worship. SubhanAllah. I mean, the mind doesn't accept it. How can someone introduce a good act of worship? Once they're introducing, it's no longer good. Because they're introducing something which the Prophet did not introduce. Malum? Okay. So there's no such thing as good bid'ah. Because the Prophet said, Kullu bid'atin dalala. Every innovation will lead astray. <coughs> so after he said every, no one can come and further divide his statement. If I say everyone here is going to get a, a, a bottle of water, okay? No one can come and say, no, 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 he really doesn't mean that. He means every, you know, 25 year old male with a beard. I didn't say that. Who gave you the right to speak on my behalf? I said every, I mean every. Prophet said every. Somebody's going to come and say, no, excuse me. Every doesn't really mean every. It means, no, no, no. This is nonsense. This is nonsense. There's no good innovation. Allah says in the Quran, أَمْ لَهُمْ شُرَكَاءٌ شَرَعُ لَهُمْ مِنَ الدِّينِ مَا لَمْ يَأْدَمْ بِهِ اللَّهِ Or do they have partners who introduce, who legislate for them in the religion that which Allah did not legislate? SubhanAllah, what is this? So, you know, this is another lecture as well. But in the meantime, no, no. Can someone shake the hand of a woman for business meetings? Because by not shaking the hand, it may cause more harm. Ya salam. <laughs> I don't know what more harm, what worse harm is there. Losing some fulus, right? Such as not getting employed for a job, even the handshake is without desire and only as a one-off. <coughs> no. No. And finally, no. Look. Remember what I said? Lack of what? Con contemplation. Look at it from the other side. This job is a test from Allah. This job is a test from Allah. Knowing you'll be in a predicament where you may disobey Him. He will place you there. Will you favor Allah and please Him and abandon the job? Or will you follow your desires for the job and disobey Allah? Don't look at it as material and business and I will lose getting employment. The, the, the employment came from Allah. And if it doesn't come, it is from Allah. And the other one with the right hand, thank you, sir. It, too late. It will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also. You follow me? So look at it as a test from Allah. Allah knew. Allah decreed that this will happen. So this is the moment of truth. You're standing there. And the job is on the line. I will get it or get rejected. But it is on the expense of what? Compromising what? My religious commitment as a man. Rasulullah had said it is better for a man to have an iron stick go into his head before he puts his hand on a woman, which is not lawful to him. Not shake hands, shake, you know, it, it requires grabbing, right? Touching, putting your finger. It is better for you to have some metal go in your head before you do so. So then, this is a moment of truth. If you are an in intelligent person, <coughs> Who wants Jannah, you will not do it. And if you don't get if you don't get the job, you will leave saying, Alhamdulillah, Allah will give me something. I was tested by Allah and I passed the test. You will leave happy that you passed the test which Allah gave you. You will not leave sad, I didn't get the job. Because Allah is the one who controls everything. If He wills, He will give you a better job. So what is it? A test. Secondly, use it for da'wah. Why don't you use it for da'wah? Say, excuse me, I am not, I am not, you know, uh, 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 I'm not, the word is not coming to me, no. uh, refraining from shaking your hand as means of insulting you or belittling you. On the other hand, 
as a Muslim who abides by the teachings of Islam, woman is not, you know, something that is insignificant to us. She's a, a human being with, with, you know, equal opportunity to go to paradise and so on and so forth. Consequently, she has a right not to be touched by a stranger and I have an obligation not to touch a strange woman. So I'm only following Islam, which gives you rights, which the other people are not giving you, and gives me rights, which, which require me to respect you and give you your rights. And you know what? This is da'wah. She may say, hey, that's what I've been looking for. It seems that everybody just wants to shake my hand for some other reasons, not to get a job. So this will make the woman realize that she is respected in Islam. So you can turn it into a da'wah, you know, opportunity. But without that, if you're unable to do that, then you don't shake the hands. And, uh, you know, as they say in the in slang in, in Lebanon, جَعَلْ عِمْرُ مَا يجي. May this job never come to you if it's going to cause you to disobey Allah. From the beginning, you're going to become, you know, like the people who get married. You know, funny people. From the first day, the day when they need Allah's blessings the more, Allah's guidance, Allah's protection, they begin their life with sin. Music and men and women mixing and dancing, they begin their life upon disobedience. What do you expect to be coming in the future? Nothing but, 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 a'udhu billah, evil. So, <coughs> If you want to begin your job on good terms with Allah, then begin a job where you were pleasing Allah in the beginning. And then Allah will make your, your sustenance lawful with the Allah. Tayyip. MashaAllah. As usual, the questions are more than the lecture. Many people are celebrating Eid Milad, birthday of Prophet How to uh, counterfeit? Uh, are the rules of Lebanon Muslims? Ouch. Uh, concerning the first, this will be, there will be another lecture dedicated strictly to celebrations. Inshallah, you will know it when you read the title. So allow me to postpone this till then. If you're dying to know, just email me at one way to paradise at gmail.com. Are the Druze of Lebanon Muslims? No, they are too far. <coughs> they believe in incarnation. Right? Meaning you die and you come back as your, you know, someone else, and then someone else and someone else. They don't believe in you know accountability and all the things which we believe in, and consequently they're not among the Muslims. From the evidence, uh, you presented that adhan in the right ear from, newborn, uh, from the newborn uh, can, be, cannot, can no longer be used. So what you should do from now on while the new baby is born? Well, what we have from the sunnah, good question, mashallah. The sunnah indicates that when the newborn baby is born, that you get some dates, right? And you kind of the, the, the rub it on your finger, and okay, you don't give him a date. Some people, you know, get excited and say, give it a date. This poor man, he can't even suckle yet, you know? And with, with the seed inside, right? He'll manage to take it out with the steam, which he doesn't have. Anyways, so you get some dates, and you make it soft and, you know, mushy like that, and you rub his gums with it. You rub his gums with it, just something sweet. This is the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa uh, this is the only thing that we know of as far as at the moment of birth. Now, after seven days, you shave the hair, and then the weight, you, 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 you value that in silver, then you give sadaqah equal to the, the value of silver, if they are like three grams, so what is three, gra three grams of silver is 50 riyas, you give sadaqah 50 riyas, <coughs> you uh, slaughter two sheep, if it is a male, one if it is a girl, uh, if you haven't named them, it may be the sunnah to name them on the seven days, because there were such indications, there are times the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that it's a sunnah as to name on the seventh day. And there were times where he named his son on the day he was born. He said, I was blessed with the son today and I, and I named him tonight and I named him Ibrahim. Right? Uh, so the two sheep or the one for the female, uh, the circumcision of course for the boys and so on and so forth and khalas. This, I mean, uh, <coughs> this is what I can recall right now. And I cannot elaborate because I don't want to keep you here until midnight. Uh, let me go back. These have been dealt with, okay. Assalamu alaikum. Given a then in the newborn's uh, ear a weak hadith. What about other issues? Okay. Shaving the head, I just dealt with. Tahnik, I just dealt with. Shaving the girl's head. There's a difference of opinion concerning the, the girl. Uh, some of the scholars say, even the girl, you shave her head. I mean, shaving the head is actually good for the, for the head in terms of the hair growth. The, according to the doctors, it helps strengthen uh, the hair and, you know, the whatever things that grow the hair. It's, there's a medical discussion concerning that. And you know, some of the opinions of the scholars mention that the, the girls can be included in the shaving the head as well. Some of them say strictly for the boys. Uh, some people say, Makruh na'am, you're right. Some people do, so, uh, do say so. Can you give more details of the correct uh, sunnah concerning newborns? I mean, this is what I know. There's a difference of opinion. Uh, I, uh, 
personally, you know, I, I believe that it, it is okay for the girls as well, right? Based on the, what I've read from the fatwa of the ulama. <coughs> salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Worshipping in the masjid behind someone who's wearing, uh, uh, okay, some, some drawing, I guess, example of eagle. Uh, please explain. Well, I mean, we should not, we should not go to the salah <coughs> with clothing that contain images. We should not be wearing clothes with images, clothes, I'm sorry, clothes with, with images, period, right? It's just it's not from our, you know, way of life. Uh, because angels do not enter a place where, where images are. And we're speaking of images of, of things that possess souls, like human beings and animals. Uh, so, but if someone is leading you in the salah, I have no knowledge whether the salah is sound, valid, or invalid. This is beyond me. So Allah Ta'ala I heard a hadith where the believers were praying, that, I don't know what they did, tadawi, tarawih, I guess, individually in the masjid, he ordered them to pray behind Ibn Mas'ud, Umar. <coughs> well, this is a good bid'ah. Uh, we have a few I issues here. Uh, first, <coughs> he did not call them or uh, command them to pray behind Ibn Mas'ud. Right? He commanded to pray behind who? Who is Shabab? Who was the first one who was made to lead the Muslims in Taraweeh? Umar commanded who? Ka'ab. Radiallahu anhu. Ubay ibn Ka'ab. Ubay ibn Ka'ab. This was the one who led the Nara ibn Mas'ud. Secondly, you have to go back to the interpretation of the ulama concerning the statement of Ibn Umar, Ni'ma al-Bid'ati hadi. Good bid'ah. The actual bid'ah here can be understood linguistically or legally. What he was referring to was the linguistic meaning and not the legal meaning. Evidence. Who was the first one to lead Muslims in congregation in Taraweeh? The Prophet Why did he not continue? He was afraid it would become obligatory. We would not be able to handle it. He left it alone for what? For a reason. When he died, alayhi salatu salam, can it ever become obligatory? No, no more wahi. So then the illa is gone, we can go back to the sunnah, which is what? Praying in congregation. So logically, there's no bid'ah there. Forget about the wording used. In fact, there's no innovation. So then we understand the statement in the light of the understanding <coughs> of uh, Umar radiallahu anhu wa ardha. Yes, sir. <coughs> He didn't? He didn't? He someone would like to you know go further with this to end the discussion our default answer is look this is from the sunnah of Umar the same way Uthman um, who gave two adhan you accepted that huh? otherwise you should stop the second adhan if Umar did this then you should accept that as well you see that that's the first approach which puts an end to it however let's go to the understanding did the Prophet ﷺ pray at home no his house was neighboring the masjid in a sense that it was attached to the masjid. A carpet was laid out for him. Uh, the Sahaba were praying behind him. His house, as Aisha said, when he would pray with Aisha in the house, when he made sujood, he had to pinch her so she would move her legs so he could make sujood because the place was so tiny. So how was it that the masjid was packed? The hadith mentions that on the third day, the masjid was packed. It could not accommodate people anymore. An indication, I think, that they prayed in the masjid and not at home. He may, he may have started at home, people started praying behind him, and then he led them in salah in the masjid, then he stopped. 
Inshallah. The question, though, my sister asked earlier about the term good dinner, and did not come right use that term as a good dinner. Yes. Uh, how to concentrate the salah and get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, that, that is not a lecture, that is a biography. And time does not allow it. However, in the upcoming lectures, I'm not, I'm not going to mention which, this very issue will be tackled, inshallah, very much to the depth. Uh, thirdly, I got friends who are not perfect in salah religion, uh, so how to deal with it? <coughs> Should be with them or just cut off to improve our own self peace advice? No. If, if you are unable to get them on your side and you're afraid that they will get you on their side, then leave them alone. Then leave them alone so you will not be destroyed in the process. However, if you have the means to improve yourself and improve those around you, then keep company with them in order to bring them onto your side. So this is what situational. We cannot say to everyone, leave them or keep, keep them. It depends on the person and his friends his style, his character, his ability to convince people, and so on and so forth. So it is situation. Right, I believe these are uh, the last of the questions. Anything else? Right, no, they, actually there was something on the back of this one. Yeah, here. If we follow a scholar <coughs> that is more knowledgeable than, then we would be safe to say follow scholars of the West that deal with Islamic mortgages. Okay, more, oh and have more experience on the issue than to follow a scholar, uh, scholar of one in the East that has not come across this situation but rule it as haram. Example, Saudi scholars versus Western scholars. Whoa. If there are people at work that do not pray, it is obligatory for me to remind them to pray every time. Will I be sinful if I don't? Now, let's deal with the first one. Uh, you know, yes, a person being in a particular environment does help him you know, deduce the proper ruling for that environment. However, what we have to be careful of is unqualified, quote unquote, scholars who end up taking this stand and giving fatawa without being qualified simply because they are living in the West. So this is not across the board. If you have two quali equally qualified scholars, equally, and one was living in the West, and one was living in Saudi, and you wanted a ruling concerning something that is happening in the West, then you take it from the Western scholar, because he is more knowledgeable of his environment. But if you have a scholar, a mufti, and you have someone who just, you know, doesn't have, you know, the basics of the deen or some of them down, you don't get a fatwa from him, because now they tell you riba is halal. They tell you, they say, look man, you're living in the land of kuffar, huh? And you know, you can just consume it by taking it. Instead of the kuffar taking it, this is all rationalism. Why give the money to the kuffar? Take the money, help the Muslims. Ya akhi, <coughs> once you take riba, once you take it, for whatever reason, Allah has declared war against you. Allah has messenger declared war against you. In the Quran, Prophet said, Allah curses the one who pays riba, the one who consumes it, the one who writes the contract, and the two witnesses. All of them are equally cursed. Why? Because there's no room for riba in Islam. No room. So now they tell you, <coughs> they give it different names, different titles, and they try to make it lawful. No. Even if he's a Western scholar, we will not go with that. Unless he is grounded in knowledge, we know that he's qualified, he's received taskiyah from the people of knowledge, that this person is qualified to give fatwa. He knows the environment, then and only then, we look into it with, with the understanding, not with the blind following. Otherwise, we have to be very careful from individuals in the West and otherwise who take it upon themselves to convey particular information which is against the clear teachings of Islam and will be misguided in the process. Allah <laughs> Concerning the Salah, uh, yes, it is obligatory on you <coughs> to remind people who are not praying. It is obligatory on you to remind people who are not praying in the various ways possible. Inshallah, this will be elaborated upon in the upcoming lecture in the next few weeks, inshallah. And so you will know exactly how you may do so. So I would like to end this lecture now. Jazakumullah khairan. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Shalala ilaha ilaha. Astaghfirullah.